Glenn Morris from RD Voice, who is going to start with this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's good to see you all. I've never been referred to as an experiment before, but there's always a, a first time. Um, well, I, I've been invited to talk to you. I hope, I hope that by talking to you, I will be able to uh, give you a little bit of uh, inkling as to what the Arctic is like as a place to visit, um, why I've become so concerned about it, and also take you through a bit of a journey through my first uh, forays into the Arctic, and then where I am now with it, and where mentally I think I stand on the whole issue of climate change and what's going on in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic uh, is, is, a, is a place that often, by some people, is mistaken with the Antarctic, but of course you all know the Arctic is up north, and unlike the Antarctic, uh, the Arctic is an inhabited place where uh, migrant hunter-gatherers moved from the Siberian areas east and colonised all, all of what is northern Canada now and the east and west coasts of Greenland. I've lived and spent time with the Arctic people and the reason I think it's quite an interesting area to uh, study is that it is actually, not strictly, but probably one of the last vestiges of what you call a hunter-gatherer culture. So the people that live in the Arctic, although now they are very much if you like, being engulfed by Western consumerism. There is still a huge part of it that is still hanging on to this hunter-gatherer culture. So they don't have the same concept of property ownership that we have. And their ways of living are also very, very different. I might elaborate on some of those at this time, but I'm conscious of the fact that when you're sitting down, there's nothing worse than having someone going on and on and on. So I'll try and be pretty brief in the way that I deal with things, but if, I'm sure Brian will allow questions at some point. The Arctic Voice Project, which is um, the thing that you heard Brian refer to, is an initiative that uh, I'm involved with, where we are basically carrying out a journey through the Arctic. It's through Canada's Northwest Passage. And what we're doing is we're linking up schools throughout the Arctic with schools in the UK. And our hope is, and by our, I mean there's actually uh, about five of us involved with this. Our hope is that by doing that, we will be begin to get a kind of dialogue going initially with young people, students at schools, both in the UK and the Arctic, that will extend into communities. And by doing this, we will help people to understand why our way of life in the so-called civilized West affects people in other parts of the world. That, that is our plan. Now, the journey is by kayak, uh, and it's arguably an environmentally friendly way of travelling through the Arctic, and when we meet the Arctic people, we often meet them in their settlements, having kayak two or three hundred miles without seeing anyone else, and we find that helps us engage with them, because they see a traditional craft, and uh, we're able to engage with them, and that seems to work quite well. What I would say is, and it's a, a comment that I think would be justifiable, is, is people say to me, you know, well, why, why do you fly to these places and all that sort of thing? And that is a very valid comment. Um, but what I would say to that is I'm hoping, or initially I hope, that this project would be a success in terms of what it achieved. And, and the sort of, I hesitate to use the word raising awareness, because I really feel that if people aren't aware of what's going on at the moment, they must be absolutely balmy. But so I won't use that term again, but we were hoping that um, the value of the project would outweigh the act of flying to this, these places. I think one of the things I will um, talk about is uh, the beauty of the Arctic as well. I'm going to show you some slides that hopefully you will be able to see on the screen next to me here. These are of the uh, trips I have done to the Arctic. Even, each individual expedition to the Arctic has been arguably kind of talk in its own right. But uh, I'll just show you one or two images from each of those, and I'm hoping that you'll think you'll kind of have an understanding of why the place to me is so beautiful. Um, what I'd like to do is initially talk a little bit about how I feel about what's going on in the Arctic before going into the, um, the slides. 
One of the uh, things that's occurred to me is that it seems to me to be a kind of a microcosm for what's going on in the, West of the rest of the world. Because the kind of movement and transition between hunter-gatherer and what we see now has happened very, very quickly indeed. It's literally over the last generation or two. And that is actually quite an astounding change in a very short space of time. And now you may wonder what this poem's got to do with it, but I think by the end of the talk I'm hoping you all, you all understand a little more about that. This is a, a little poem called Time of Simplicity by John Lane. The industrialist was horrified to find the fisherman lying beside his boat, smoking his pipe. Why aren't you fishing, said the industrialist, because I've caught enough fish for the day. Well, why don't you catch some more? Well, what would I do with them? Well, you could earn more money. Then you could have a motor fixed to your boat and go into deeper waters and catch more fish. That would bring you money to buy nylon nets. So more fish, more money. Soon you could have enough money to buy two boats, even a fleet of boats, and then you could be rich like me. Well, what would I do then? Then you could just sit back and enjoy life. Well, what do you think I'm doing now? <laughs> now, the point of that, I think, I hope, will come out in, in some of the, these images and everything else, and that is... I believe we've got to the point now in life where we are losing, entirely losing touch with the environment. Now, this is the angle I'm coming from. I'm, I'm, I, I believe that there have been occasions when I've been fortunate enough, and I have to say I am very fortunate in being able to travel to the Arctic. But there have been occasions when I've engaged with the environment in a way that I don't think I could ever have done had I not have been in those environments. I'll give you an example of a few cases. One was when with another friend, we skied across Greenland. And it took us just over two months, and we pulled our sledges with all our food. There were two of us. And we were fo following the route originally taken by the Norwegian explorer, Fridtjof Nansen. Now, when we got to the other side, we had a fantastic time. It was an emotional and spiritual and uh, physical kind of upheaval. But we got to the other side, and we had no food there. So we were both hungry. Now, being someone from what one might loosely term middle class background uh, living in southern England, I wasn't used to being hungry. It was something that hadn't happened to me before. But what did happen was, when we got to the west coast of Greenland, I found a kind of um, deep-seated um, primeval feeling coming out inside me. And I began to look at the environment, not as something that was hostile and something to be feared, but I actually looked at it as I imagine a, an animal would look at it. And I started seeing it and looking, not as threatening, but somewhere where I could get food from. And I remember walking along a beach and seeing some rotted, semi-rotted fish on the beach, and I thought, well, there's some food there. I could actually eat that, so that's okay. And it came out for about two or three days until we were picked up, and it was the most liberating and amazing feeling. I've never felt anything like it. But the point I'm trying to make was it helped me engage with the environment in a way that I could never, ever have imagined doing before. One other example of this is, uh, was last year when we began the kayak journey through the uh, Northwest Passage. And there were two of us in a tent, and we had a lot of bear encounters. We saw about two or three grizzly bears a day, generally speaking, when we were kayaking. And we'd see them on the beach, ambling along. Uh, we'd been paddling for about 18 hours, and we made camp, and very, very early in the morning, it must have been about three, when you were in that hazy sort of depth of sleep, and you're not really awake, I woke up suddenly and sensed a movement outside the tent. And there was a grizzly bear outside the tent. They were eight foot high, these things. Very, very big animals. And Stephen, who was with me, I'll see a couple of pictures of him, I'm sure. Um, I woke him up and said, Stephen, there's a bear outside. And we sort of, I just saw this brown shape sort of moving around. It was a very hazy light. This thing reared up on its back legs and just smashed down the tent with us in it. And at which point I had one of those um, air horns that people use for football matches. And I just about managed to reach that. We also had a rifle tent and a shotgun, but I couldn't manoeuvre the rifle safely with him next to me. So I stand with this air horn. It, it smashed down on the tent incident. It just bashed the tent to bits with us in it. And it's, as we stand with the air horn, it kind of moved off. And then I Steve managed to get out of the other end of the tent, and he fired a shotgun into the air and uh, scared the bear away. The point I'm making again there is that I was absolutely terrified. And 
the bear ambled off, but I suddenly thought how weak and feeble we are as human beings in this environment. And we sometimes just forget that sort of thing. Most human beings, or a lot of human beings, I, I doubt if there's anyone here like that, but most human beings have this kind of feeling that we can control our environment. To some, we will always be able to fix it or have a solution to something. Even now, the Americans are chucking stuff in the air to try and make rain clouds appear where they want them to appear. This sort of thing, to me, has become very worrying indeed. The Arctic Voice Project, coming back to that again, I went there with the idea that we were going to be able to help the Inuit people. We're going to go there, and we're going to come back to the UK, and we're going to tell the UK about their plight. And everyone's going to think, oh, we're really concerned, we're going to change everything and make it all better. I have to say, I, I'm not an expert on politics, I'm not a politician, I don't come with any religious background either. Um, I'm sure I'm in the presence of people who are far, far more knowledgeable on things than I am. But I have to say, I, I'm really struggling at the moment with what we're doing, hoping, thinking that will it be better, won't it? I, I really don't know right now. And as I come, when I come back from the first phase of this expedition, I realised that the Arctic is actually a culture sort of on the verge of extinction, I would say. And it's very, very sad because I think the Inuit elders are um, astounding when you talk to them. And I've spent a lot of time with them and talked to them, and I'll go into that a bit later. But I think that what's happened now, as I said, a microcosm of what's happening in the rest of the world, this idea of commerce, um, sorry, commerce um, industrialisation and everything is plunging into the Arctic uh, with a force that is just unbelievable. Uh, in 2005, I was asked to talk at the EU uh, conference in Brussels, and I left there feeling thoroughly uh, upset because I was asked as someone who'd been to the Arctic, there's also someone from uh, Iqaluit there, uh, an Inuit man, and there were some NGOs and various other people, the WWF and so on and so forth. But the main thrust of the discussions of what was going on in the Arctic were that when that ice all melts, which it is doing, it's going to be great because we can go in and there'll be, be able to drill more oil and so on and so forth. So you have all this going on. And I just can't believe, and I still can't believe, how this idea, this concept of economy, which is actually quite an abstract thing, takes absolute precedence over the well-being of the planet, <laughs> Uh, the people and the animals that we share the planet with. Now, I find that a real problem. And if you don't think, any of you, that um, uh, that is the case, so if you think that actually people are put first, that is, in my view, a nonsense. I mean, I can't get, I've got loads of things written down here that, that will illustrate, in my view, that. But an example to me was I, the other day on the news, I heard of these people, these men, that were called Bevan's Boys. Now, I don't know if any of you listened to the news and heard that article, but Bevan's Boys were the name given to a group of miners who, in the Second World War, um, basically kept the mines going. Now, these men had to tr crawl about one and a half miles down the, in these mine shafts and get to the mine face, the coal face, by six in the morning and spend their entire day bashing away at the coal. Now, they only just, a week or two ago, have been recognised for that effort. So a mile and a half. And they we listen to these old guys talking, and they go, oh, it's, well, we did what we should, and it was great fun, and you know, it was good camaraderie. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And they said, breathing in all this coal dust and everything else. Do you know what they got for that? They got recognition, it was a two or three minute thing on the news. They got a badge. That is all they got for that. Now, this illustrates to me, in a slightly humorous way, that actually people aren't cared about. And I think the idea that you know, we can trust governments of the world, not just the UK, to care about people is erroneous. I don't think we can. <coughs> Another example of how governments view nature was illustrated to me when I heard Andrew Mitchell talking on Radio 4. And he was saying, he illustrated again, very simply, one simple sentence. He, incidentally, is the uh, director and founder of the Canopy um, organization in the world that deals with forests in the world. And he also deals with the Amazon rainforest. He said, the Amazon rainforest is worth more cut down than his standing up. And that very succinctly, I think, illustrates the, sort of, the awful situation we're in. 
Anyway, I'm going to show you a few slides, um, but before I do, I think there's still lots more I'd like to tell you, but I'm very conscious of the time. I, it's awful when people go on and on and on. And last night I gave a talk, and I did feel myself going on a bit. And I almost felt that the people at the end of it wanted to ring the Samaritans. It was really important. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to avoid that too much stuff. I mean, I'm conscious of talking to people here that I suspect are down the more intelligent than I am. I'm just going to... This magazine is interesting. I don't know if you've ever read or subscribed to this. Now, it's a very interesting one to me, and, and I've come to it recently. Now, I'm not saying for one minute, go out and subscribe to it, but I am saying the articles in here are astoundingly interesting, and they really seem to get 99% of stuff right, but they miss the key thing. And I wonder if I could possibly even um, illustrate that by uh, um, reading you a little bit. One is, in, on this one, which is the March one, um, you've got an example. This is why I think our system is wrong. I'll get onto that later, but I'm sure everyone else here will be able to talk to that better than me. There's an article in here that talks about Whole Foods, and there's a company that's called the Whole Foods Market. There's some great things in here, actually. It's really, really, really good. And basically, there's this huge company called Whole Foods Market, and they became famous for their... Um, you know, supermarket selling whole foods, but it says in here, and I'll quote straight out of here, it says, um, they're talking about the company and the introduction of whole foods into supermarkets. Their use means most farms have to be able to supply large volumes of produce in order to be economically attractive to whole foods market. Small local, local farms are squeezed out as the company sacrifices ecological sustainability for artificially low prices and the convenience of the large producers. Cementing these distribution centres into its way of doing business, Whole Foods Market has recently instigated its local producer loan programme. Through this, small farms can take out a loan from the company in order to expand to the point where they are able to produce enough volume to be accepted as a supplier. As the loans are charged up to 9 cents per annum, they net the company a tidy profit while actively undermining the small local farms it claims to champion. What that illustrates to me is Really, no matter what you were trying to sell, it, you end up going the same way in the end. This company set out to sell nice muesli and you know, bio-friendly packages and everything else, but they've gone the same route as everyone else. And my feeling is that you actually can't avoid that. And this is, I think, the problem I'm finding. For my sins, I'm a tree surgeon. That's what I do for a living. So for some time now, I've had a, a, a small company, and this is... This has put me in a position, actually, where I am fortunate enough on occasions to have gone to the Arctic. But people say to me, oh, that must be fantastic working with trees. It must be really lovely, you know, work planting trees and climbing around in trees. And, and that's what I do. But actually, you, you cannot get off this kind of treadmill. That means you cannot be sustainable, if you like, and all this environmentally friendly stuff. You can't. You just cannot. The reason you can't is this. If I go up to Mrs. Jones and I say to her, well, Mrs. Jones, it's going to cost you £260 to prune your oak tree. Firstly, that oak tree probably doesn't need pruning anyway. 99% of the work I do with trees is absolutely unnecessary as far as the tree goes. I must tell you that. Trees get on fine as they are. It's nearly always what the person wants. So what I tend to get when I look at tree work is, Oh, can I do so now? It's sick and all. It's dripping stuff all over my car. I get that sort of thing a lot. You know, or I get that bird's always crapping on my car. I can't go, you know, and all that. You get loads and loads of that. Sometimes you get stuff that's quite nice that I used to be able to enjoy a view over there and I can't see it anymore. That's another reason you might prune a tree. Or you'll get a big dead tree next to a motorway. So, so all those cars will keep going backwards and forwards. You've got to take the dead tree down. But 99% of the time, it's a complete waste of time. But coming back to what the point I was making, and that is that to do that job in a way that is environmentally friendly, we would have to climb those trees with hemp ropes. That's no problem, we can still do that. We'd have to use hand saws, take our time over the job. We couldn't think of it in terms of time, which I have to now. We'd leave the cuttings perhaps in a heap on the ground so they walk it quietly away. None of that goes on. We use massive wood chippers, 16,000 quid each. Huge lorries to transport this stuff up and down the roads because no one wants it anymore. They just want to see the back of it all. And basically, no matter how hard we try, we can't be sustainable. 
And I think that applies to almost every business, as that whole food thing uh, illustrated. You, you on a kind of surging platform that you that is very hard um, to get off, if not impossible in the present system. One more thing I would say um, on the subject of trees, which is interesting, is a little analogy, a little story I'll tell you. Um, having been in trees for a long time, we, we had quite a broad uh, bunch of customers, and one of my clients, or our clients I should say, is a guy that is now one of the wealthiest people in the UK. Years ago, we used to work for this chap before he became like you know, up there in the stratosphere. And um, he was quite, he's quite a nice, a bit eccentric, quite a nice sort of bit of a buffoon, really. But he was a nice enough chap, and we used to sort of meet him and prune his trees for him and so on. But as he's got more and more wealthy, he doesn't come to sort of horny handed, grubby tradesmen like me anymore. He has consultants to do that for him. And so, a few years ago, I quoted for a job for him, which was felling a big ash tree. I digressing, I told you I'd be quick and going off again. Uh, I was failing this big ash tree. Anyway, so I gave this guy a price to do this tree. Never heard any more about it. We do often work for him. Anyway, so I spoke to his consultant, not to him, and this lady saying, Oh, we want a price to do this. Anyway, so a year after that, um, I was called back again, and the same ash tree was still there, sort of half pruned and all looked really odd. So I looked at him, and she said, Oh, well, can you give us a price to take this tree right down? So I said, well, um, yeah, I'll give you a price for that lump stone, didn't I? And she said, oh yes, but you're far too expensive. Now, on that point, I'll just stop for a minute, because far too expensive, this guy, whose house it was, earns 20, if you can say earns, 20 million pounds a year. He often has bonuses of 20 million pounds a year. And that's, so 40 million in one year, okay? But we're too expensive. The guys I work with can hardly afford to buy a house in the Seven Oaks area. Now, I don't know how to go at Seven Oaks. There may be someone from Seven Oaks here. Last night, I, I got moaned at having a go at Seven Oaks. And uh, I've got nothing against Seven Oaks at all, but it does tend to have an awful lot of very wealthy people there. And I think they leave, leave themselves somewhat open for a bit of a, a bashing sometimes. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, so I'm going off from that, yeah. So she asked me to quote the phallic entirely. So I said, well, okay, but you know, she said, not. I said, I gave you a quote for Yes, Yes, you were far too expensive. So we need another product. So I said, why did the guys that started it? And she said, oh, well, they were, they were operating dangerously and one of them had an accident and so on and so forth. To me, again, that illustrates another point. If you, if you try and do something cheaply, it puts a strain on the guys that are doing the job. I know that from my own work. If I asked our guys, I said, look, this, can you get that job done quicker? The standard will drop and their safety will be compromised. Because they're trying to do something quickly, they're going to have an accident with a chainsaw. Okay, so this whole idea that we can have businesses that carry on sort of in this kind of ethical, sustainable way is a nonsense. You have to give an absolute open check, if you like. You have to be able to say, guys, that's the job. Take as long as it takes to do a brilliant job safely. But that you can't do that when people are geared up on costs and money and everything else. Okay, so let's just... Uh, Move on to the slide. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that some of this would be sort of vaguely entertaining and not me just watching on in a, in a way. Um, I'd like you for a minute just to take a look at these. I hope you can see these. I mean, there's, a, there's spaces here for anyone who wants to move down because some of you are a little way off. These are the traditional craft of the Inuit people, uh, the kayak. Kayak is an Inuktitut word that means hunting boat. And I've been out with these guys hunting uh, in northwest Greenland and they are the most amazing people. One thing they tell me about humanity is that anyone that tells you that there is a selfish gene is basically, you know, talking nonsense. The Inuit people are not inherently selfish as a people. If you visit them, they will take you into their houses and they will feed you and they will look after you and they will share their food with you. And in particular, want to share this. Uh, bit of seal meat here with them that day, but uh, <laughs> you have to be weaned onto that with a seal pizza really, but um, these craft are quite dangerous things in some respects because they're quite tippy, but when you get used to them they are one of the most seaworthy boats you can imagine, and uh, the things on the back incidentally are inflated seal bladders, so when they harpoon the seals, it keeps the seal in visibility and they can go and uh, pick it up later. The journey we're making, and as I say I'm in my head there are question marks, and I'm sure some of you might ask me some questions that will throw me on this as to 
whether it is really worth it, is from a place called Inuvik, which is up in the Northwest Territories, um, east to Tuktoyaktuk, this is all by kayak, to Polotuk, to Coppermine. The uh, Inuktitut word for Coppermine is Kugluktuk, and that's where we are, that's where we left our kayaks last year. We're going back there this year to continue the journey. We're doing, I have to say, I'm not trying to blow on the trumpet, we're doing some pretty good work, and the children are enjoying their um, uh, links up with the schools, and that's, that's working quite well. And you'll actually see a little bit of that going on, so I'm going to show you a video. I think um, we don't go, I might, I'm conscious of you needing a break as well, so don't worry, we'll go on too long. The Northwest Passage um, is the, the journey we're making. It's a historic route through Canada's archipelago. And one of the most famous characters that you may know who was associated with the North, Northwest Passage is this man, Sir John Franklin. Now, interestingly, you, the British Navy at the time were putting their, their officers out because the Napoleonic War was finished and they had you know, sort of all to do with their officers, basically. So they sent them all over the world to try and sort of look at new sources of commerce and everything else. And that was really what the Northwest Passage was all about. It was a route to Cafe. It was so that they could get spices and all the goodies back from China without, without having to get beaten up by the Portuguese and Spanish by going the other way. So that was what the Northwest Passage was really about. Even then, it was a commercial issue. Now, frighteningly, in 2007 was the first year ever that the Northwest Passage has been ice free. This is really worrying stuff. But instead of thinking, oh my God, you know, this is a real problem, what do we now do? with the world and society, what do we do? We think, oh great, we we'll get some new shipping routes going, start drilling with even more oil. In doing that, we set off these things called positive feedback mechanisms, and I'm sure you I'm sure you've heard about those. That so as the as the ice melts on the tundra, it exposes the dark soil, likewise on the sea the same. The sun hits it, it warms even quicker and the ice melts even faster. That's an example of a positive feedback mechanism. Another example might be, as the tundra melts, methane is given off into the atmosphere, which is a far worse greenhouse gas, incidentally, than carbon dioxide, therefore gets warmer quicker, so the tundra melts even quicker, and so it goes on. Another positive feedback mechanism. Polar bears, quite iconic images, as we all know. I, I think I've seen these in the wild, They're incredible animals. Um, but what we tend to lose sight of, I think they're probably going to be extinct, incidentally, by the end of the century. But what we tend to lose sight of is the smaller creatures, you know, the honeybees. I mean, these things are threatened at the moment. There are whole parts of the mouth where the honeybee seems to have disappeared this year. Now, honeybees pollinate flowers, no flowers, no people. You know, these are connections we must start to make. Actually, actually I've just said we. I'm very worried about this term, we. Let me tell you why. Another thing about this magazine, uh, as I said, they, it's an interesting magazine, lots of good articles, I suggest you read them. But throughout this magazine, I've noticed, it's a real kind of, we mustn't do this, we mustn't do that. You know, like, you know, we mustn't buy so much stuff, we must live in absolute misery, we must be this and everything else. And I'm surprised that they don't advertise birch trees at the back of that magazine, so they can thrash themselves every time they're going to be guilty about something else. This wee thing bothers me because I read recently, and I think it was it was may well have been one of an article written by someone here, that the world's I think it was 220, forgive me if I'm wrong, something like that, the world's 220 wealthiest people who would easily fit in this room, as I understand it, if they gave just four percent of their worldly belongings, their wealth if you like, they could feed house and provide medical care for the population of the entire world for a year. Which basically says, taking a little bit further, for a quarter of a century, just 200 people, in other words, and people that could fit in this room, could provide all that stuff for the entire world's population for a quarter of a century. So, um, it speaks for itself, really. I didn't tell you much about another picture, but... Uh, I suppose the picture you just saw was um, a picture of the, you know, the pile of polar bears with the explorer on the top. I don't know how to reverse this, and I'm not going to now. But it's kind of a sign of, of this sort of very selfish stuff that's sort of crept into society now, where people go and do these huge things for their own egos. They think nothing about sort of 
flying into the Arctic to climb a mountain and say how wonderful they are. I have to say I'm guilty of that, and you'll see some, some pictures um, early on. But I mean, last year, in September, September 23rd last year, the first man to climb Everest and stand on summit, summit of Everest naked happened. <laughs> and then, you do wonder where this is all going to go, and I, I tend to have a bit of a pop occasionally with these so-called explorers, because there aren't any explorers anymore, you know, we all know where everything is. I mean, the Canadians look at the, the, the Brits and think we're barmy going out to some of these places, you know, trying to do all this stuff. Some of the things I do uh, involve talking to schools, and I often talk to primary schools, and I talk to them about the Arctic and so on and so forth, and one of the pictures I show them is this, and I say, Put your hand up if you can tell me what this is. And it rather stays like that. No one puts their hand up. Now, when I was a little boy, um, too long ago now, unfortunately, but I remember having my little jam jar with a bit of string on it, and I remember wandering down to ponds and uh, the streams, and I knew what this was, as indeed did every single other child in my school. They all knew what it was. It's another example, I think. It tells you two things. It tells you that here is a small animal, that is actually threatened, a threatened species. And it also tells you that we don't really, or young people don't engage with the environment in the way that perhaps they used to. And I think that's quite sad. Um, you know, most young people, um, you know, and I'm not having to go to young people here because the whole ethos, the whole drive of what the Arctic Voice thing about is because I'm so worried about young people. I mean, I wake up every day terrified about my daughter's future. And these things concern me mentally. But it is a shame when, you know, engaging with the outside world happens through a screen now. And, you know, everyone's sort of staring at screens. You know, I got the train back from London the other day, and every single room in the house is, I looked at, you know, that thing where you look at train windows, you're peering with people's rooms on. And I'm not a boy or anything, it's just a, <laughs> <laughs> I just to do that, you know. Almost all of them were kind of looking at these screens, almost every room you look at, there's someone doing this, you know. I just think it's such a shame. And I think I feel more of that because, because I have been fortunate enough to go to the Arctic and I, I see the world as something just so beautiful and so fantastic that it seems such a shame that we're in this very rocky time now um, uh, of, of so-called climate change. Incidentally, I personally feel that climate change is a symptom of the way we live. I, it is a huge thing, and it's, why it's worrying in as much as, you know, we've got to do something about it, we know that, but it is a symptom. And I think all these things that you tend to hear about, like, for example, transition towns, or, you know, these little drives here and there to sort of tinker at the edges of it all and try and make it a bit better. Whereas I think we should have had low energy, energy bulbs bloody years ago, um, I remember when I was at college years ago doing an article on low energy bulbs, and I remember writing in that article, this was 27 years ago, I remember writing that these things aren't made because they don't make a profit on them, because they last too long. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> that was the sort of thoughts I had then, but we're only just starting to sort of use them now. These are all good things, but climate change, like war, like starvation, and like all the other things that you can think of going on in the world at the moment that are bad, it's just, an, they're all symptoms of one big problem, in my view. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to some people last night, and I was asking, talking to them about this, and I said, if you don't believe that, then take, for example, Oxfam, Green and Common. I remember the ladies at Green and Common, I remember what was happening. C&D, Make Poverty History, good old Bob Geldof for that. Has any of that worked? And the answer is no. People are more poor now than ever. And that, you know, if anyone tells you, even you in China, well, they're not actually getting men off. That's not true at all. The poor are getting poorer. Not only are they getting poorer, they're having their whole uh, livelihood <coughs> wrecked by their rivers running with toxins as all these new power stations are being built. So, although climate change is very, very serious and it's part of all this stuff I'm doing, it's, I believe, a symptom. Now, one thing I tended to do was have a pop at Seven Oaks Housewives because they all, for some odd reason, seem to want to drive big black vehicles like this. And um, where I work with the trees, it's in that area in Kent. And I have to say, this is not a mock-up picture. In fact, it wasn't all my camera only took that many. There were actually more of these things. And this is a private school. 
I've got nothing against private schools particularly, but there's a private school in Seven Oaks, and you, all these mums are coming in, sweeping in with their tiny sprog in the back, and their swept back hair and sunglasses up on their heads, and yeah. they really think they're it. And I used to really kind of have a go at them, you know, and it's a bit mean really, because actually, um, I suppose really they're fed the same myth as all of us. They kind of they're made to feel, through no choice of their own, quite frankly, that they've arrived when they've got one of these vehicles. And they really do feel that. You can tell as they look down on you and they drive by. Um, so I'm, quite, I'm less harsh on them now. To put it <laughs> but uh, I better move on. With that. I used to put this in when I was sort of in a different sort of um, area. I, I do think, of course, it's it's wrong to. Um, fly, but of course, you know, flying is being sold to us at the best form of transport all the time. It's an absolute nonsense. Anyone that tells you flying is not bad, it is bad. It's where it puts the stuff into the atmosphere. Some people might say it only produces sort of 15% of the carbon emissions. Well, maybe it does, but it produces a lot of other stuff as well, and it's where it happens. And it is an increasing thing with government, as you know, by the new EFO terminal, are encouraging it. They're not saying we shouldn't fly. It fly. You try and get a train to Glasgow, it probably, probably cost you about 250 quid, you can fly it for five. So, you know, <laughs> who's going to do it? It's madness, it's absolute madness. But the other thing, of course, about going long distance, I've travelled to the Arctic on now on a few occasions, and actually, if you arrive by boat or that, <coughs> it's a much better way of arriving somewhere, quite frankly. A plane has actually become a really horrible way of travelling, in my view. Children, I think that our children face a, a really, really worrying future. But I, don't, I do think it's immoral to um, shove the responsibility onto them, quite frankly. Um, I'm worried because, it, you know, I come back to this we thing again. If we think that world governments care about children, I, I don't believe they do. Uh, last, last week I read that sort of 20,000 uh, men, women and children were kicked out of part of South Africa so that Anglo-American could move in and mine the area. 20,000 happens to be the population of Seven Oaks. And I do wonder <laughs> whether if the population of Seven Oaks was kicked out so that a mining operation go on, you know, what might happen? The fact is those people are poor and unimportant. That's why, you know, they can get kicked out of their home like homesteads. It's, it's pretty, pretty grim, really. I'm nothing against people in Seven Oaks. These are some children at a school uh, in Kent, and this was a, a little launch we had about the, Ar the Arctic Voice project. And I have to say, seeing these children brought tears to my eyes because uh, there's an age where children engage, you know, they, they don't have all this sort of uh, baggage that older people tend to have. And I'm just, I had a lump in my throat, in, in all honesty, because they were just so interested in what was going on. They want things to be better. And you feel sorry for them because they are just swept into this huge thing that is, you know, commerce and profit driven sales and everything else. And it's so terribly sad. I mean, even at that age, you know, there's product placement, they're going to, you can't go anywhere without children being sold, you know, sugar and rubbish that's going to make them addicted to it. And they can't get away from it. I mean, some of them, their parents even encourage it, you know, buy these happy meals from McDonald's, you know. I, I don't know what's so happy about that sort of diabetes and all that stuff, but I mean, they must find something happy there. This is the east coast of Greenland. And I'm going to whiz through a few slides now, because this is just going to give you a feel of the Arctic and uh, take a little sort of, you know, armchair holiday there, if you like. This is uh, the Nansen Strait, and that's all the pack ice sweeping down towards the southern tip of Greenland. And my friend took that picture of me the first time I went to Greenland.